Listen, I'm really thrilled this morning to be able to introduce our guest speaker. When I heard that he was going to be in our area for this weekend, I contacted him and asked him if he would once again teach here at Victory. He's not a stranger to some of us, to some of you. He will be brand new, but he is just a man of great humility, a man who has a heart for the Father. He is the leader for the Wesleyan Church, which is quite a, a denomination all over the world. And he was elected to that position in 2016, and he has brought his humility, his wisdom, and his vision to what God wants to do through this movement we call the church. His name is Wayne Schmidt. He likes to be called Wayne. He was a chief administrative officer for Wesley Seminary. In those beginning days, he helped establish the seminary and has done quite well. He is a pastor or was at one point. He's done church planning. He's written books and just a wonderful individual. We're so honored that he is here to do a great teaching. You're going to love the three questions he's about to put in front of you. So what I want to encourage you to do, go to your bulletin right now. You're going to see a teaching outline. I hope you'll take down these questions. And when you leave here today, it will be something that you will begin to ask yourself. God has a word for you. I hope you know it. You're not here by accident. God wants to speak into your life, and He is going to use His servant. So would you join me, please, in offering a warm victory welcome to Dr. Wayne Schmidt. Well, it's great to be back with Victory. Uh, Pastor Paul's one of my favorite people in the whole world. Uh, Thursday, Friday night, we went out to dinner together, and I can tell he's not only uh, my favorite person, but about everybody in the restaurant who stopped by and interrupted our time together uh, to say hi to him. It is so good to be here for another reason. Uh, I was here before, and I got invited back, and that doesn't happen very often, so I'm really delighted to be with you on Father's Day. My father, it's hard to believe, it was 25 years ago that he went to be with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and uh, I was 35 years old when that happened. It seemed like it was all too soon. I got a text this morning from one of my uh, dear friends. We've been friends since college, and this will probably be his last Father's Day with his dad because of a diagnosis of cancer. And uh, what a void in my life. Um, And what an opportunity for the Heavenly Father to, in very uh, meaningful ways, step in and and touch my life. And today we're going to focus on a father-son conversation that's found in John 17. It's a conversation between Jesus and his heavenly father. Now, I remember with my dad, my dad was a builder, and I started working in the family business when I was 12 years of age. And so I saw my dad at home. I saw him at church. I saw him at work. He was the same type of person in all of those arenas. Loved the conversations I had with him. And this is the longest recorded interaction we have with Jesus and his father. And it's getting towards the end of Jesus's ministry. Some tough things are ahead. And he has this conversation with God. And in the midst of this conversation, there's a verse that just hopped out to me years ago and connected with me, I think for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, I read a book about that same time by Gary Thomas. It's called Sacred Pathways. And while we all connect to our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ, one of the things Gary Thomas pointed out is we tend to have different pathways. We're wired in different ways in order to experience that closeness, that intimacy with God. And one of those pathways, by the way, I've uh, put that resource uh, up on the screen for you because it's really a place where you can go and take a little, uh, uh, little questionnaire and get a sense of what your pathway might be. Well, mine is activist. I'm kind of an action oriented person. And this verse, John 17, 4 is an action-oriented verse. 
Jesus says in this verse, in this longer conversation with the Father, Father, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Active. Second reason I so appreciate it is it's Jesus. And I know around here you talk a lot about the Jesus way of life and living a life that follows him. And this is what he said in a conversation toward the end of his life. Obviously, it was very important that he would focus on this in his conversation with his father. He says, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Well, over time, this verse so captured my heart that it became my life verse. I focus on a verse every year to memorize and speak into my life, but this one is lifelong verse. So every morning before I get out of bed, I quote this verse quietly to myself because um, I don't know how many of this is true in your but I'm a morning person. I'm married to a night person. <laughs> Have you ever noticed how opposites attract? I, like, uh, give me, uh, hopefully I'll do a little bit better than Pastor Aaron did with his survey, so we'll try this. How many of you would say opposites have attracted in terms of being a morning person, a night person? Can I see your hands, please? Wow, lots of you. That's true for Jan and me. She doesn't like me to talk to her in the morning. The only thing she likes me to do in any relationship to her in the morning is make sure her coffee is ready when she gets up. So uh, in the morning, I uh, to myself, because if I say it out loud, uh, God's not going to get glory and I'm not going to feel very good about it. Uh, so she's going to let me know. But I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And then I ask myself, Three questions to frame how I hope to live that day. And year after year, day after day, these three questions embedded in my life verse have raised my batting average a little bit in terms of living faithfully with God. Here's the first question. Who gets the glory? I have brought you, Heavenly Father, glory on earth. Now, you're in a series on Daniel, and one of the reasons that this focus is so important to me on a daily basis is because of the human tendency to be a glory grabber. In fact, it goes back before humanity. Satan himself, who was an angel in heaven, falls from heaven because he gets his hands on God's glory. And every once in a while, I have to go to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 4, where Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the most mighty kingdom on the face of the earth, strolls out on his balcony one day and he says this to God. Maybe not even to God, maybe just anyone who will listen. Is this not the great Babylon that I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Uh-oh. Fighting words. Nebuchadnezzar thinks... All that stuff is his. He thinks he made it happen. And God sometimes has to remind us that even the basics of life, even a gift like mental health is very fragile. Because Nebuchadnezzar soon finds himself grazing in the fields. He's lost his mind. He's grazing like an animal till his hair grows, until it's like feathers. And one day he wakes up to this reality. And here's what he says from the balcony. Now I, Neb, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven. 
because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. Those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. So every day I'm reminded any time God wants, he can say, hey, Wayne, go graze in the fields for a while till you figure out whose kingdom this really is. I have brought you glory on earth. You know, I love that statement. I have brought you, God, glory, not myself. And I brought you glory on earth. This reminds us that glory is earthy. It's every day. You know, sometimes we think that we only glorify God when we do something big or we only glorify God when we do something that's overtly spiritual. That, you know, glory is kind of this transcendent sort of thing. But Jesus says, I have brought you glory on earth. This, this is like the everyday sort of thing. In other places in Scripture, it says whether I eat or drink or I can do it all to the glory of God. When I'm at work, I can work as unto the Lord. It's the everyday things that bring God glory. Bringing God glory is a matter of the cumulative effect of living my everyday life, the Jesus way of life, so that people say, wow, God's made a difference in his life. In fact, in another prayer, maybe we're even more familiar with, the prayer says, Jesus teaching his disciples, um, your kingdom come, your will be done. Do you remember this? On earth as it is in heaven. Here's the second question. Who sets the finish line? Who says it's complete? I have brought you glory on earth by completing, finishing the work. When I was 21 years old, I was a senior at Marion College. It's an educational institution that subsequently changed its name to Indiana Wesleyan University. I've attended four educational institutions since high school. Three of the four have subsequently changed their names. I think they're trying to distance themselves from me. But I was graduating from Marion College. A speaker came to campus, and Laurel Buckingham said, pray that God would call you to a community where you could spend a lifetime. So I grabbed my prayer partner, Dennis Jackson, and we prayed that prayer. God, I'm going to be graduating from high school. I'd really like a job. It'd be great if it's in ministry. Would you call me to a community where I could spend a lifetime? Now, there are two things unique about that challenge. One is, in the Wesleyan church tradition, we're, we're more used to the idea of being called by a church rather than called to a community. And so he said, pray that God would call you to a community. The second thing, the average pastoral tenure in those years was about every three years, a pastor would change churches, change communities. And he said, pray that God would call you to a community for a lifetime. So this 21-year-old, maybe great faith, maybe youthful naivety, whatever, I prayed that prayer with all my heart, and he did it. He called me to Kentwood, a suburb of Grand Rapids, Michigan. And there was no Wesleyan church there. It was a new suburb. It was growing like crazy. And so I was involved in a church plant team. It's easy to be called to a community. There wasn't a church to be called to. And I thought, I'm here for a lifetime. So far, so good. Well, um, first decade went by. Second decade went by of service to that church. And, and I thought, I wonder just how long a lifetime is. 
I thought, you know, well, Bible, that's a good place to go. Uh, you know, the 40 years number comes up somewhat. And it began to be God called me to this community for a lifetime to God called me to a community for 40 years. <laughs> Looking back, I call this, I added my quantification to God's revelation. I had to make it more concrete, quite frankly, because then I could control it. And I'd went there in 1979. I thought, okay, 2020, that'll be about 40 years. We have a 40-year vision. That's what God's going to do. We talked about t having 2020 vision. And then 30 years in, God said, Wayne, the person I want to lead next is now on the scene. You're done. Get out of town. It was a little longer process than that, and he's much more gracious than that, but that's how it felt. And I said, uh, excuse me, Lord, um, you're 10 years early. <laughs> Let me fill you in on my calendar here. Uh, you may not be aware how I've laid this out. He was aware. You know, I've discovered, and I, I really like this, when God's time frame and my time frame are roughly the same, it's really easy to trust. In fact, it doesn't take much trust at all. The greater the difference between God's time frame and my time frame, the greater the trust required. He said, it is finished. Now, finishing well was really important to Jesus. In fact, in John, the same chapter, this prayer is found. Verse 4, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. John chapter 5, for the very work the Father has given me to finish, I am doing, testifies the Father has sent me. John 19, Jesus said, it is finished. Hold it. He's only in his early 30s. There's a lot of people that are yet to be healed. There's a bunch of demons yet to be cast out. Those disciples, they're not a finished product, that's for sure. But the work God had for him to do, Jesus would soon say, it is finished. His timing to give him glory. So today, who gets the glory, who sets the finish line, defines what finishing well looks like, and who gives the assignment? I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. You gave me. It's God's work he gives the assignments. You know, one of the real dangers when we're in a church family like this is you can look around and you can say, wow, that person is really in tune with God. Following God and serving God must mean doing what they do. Or you might compare yourself to them and say, wow, I am ahead of them, or I'm behind them, or I could never be like them, or I never want to be like them. Copying and comparing. There was a guy in the community where I served, Grand Rapids, and uh, his name was Rich DeVos, and he had this statement, when you compare yourself to someone else, you end up living someone else's life. And what I'm seeing is that many people substitute copying or comparing for calling. 
what has God designed me to do? I am his workmanship, Ephesians 2.10. What is it? He's wired me up for the assignment he's given me. And can I be really blunt about this? Sometimes the assignment God has given you looks a lot better than the one he's given me. I want their job. Or sometime the assignment he's given me may look a lot better than what he's given you. But here's the challenge. God only gives me grace to do what he's called to do. He doesn't give me grace to do what you're called to do. If I try to do what you're called to do, I'm on my own. Because his power is for his purposes reflected in the assignments that he gives. So when I pray that prayer and ask that question each morning, I'm reminding myself that whatever you have in this day for me to do, don't look around. Don't say, I wish I didn't have to do that today, or oh, I get to do that today, and they don't. No, it's not about anyone else. It's completing the work, the assignment you gave me to do. Back to Gary Thomas, who wrote that book and designed that little guideline for, for sacred pathways. He has another statement that I think this verse and these questions help me to do. He says, being holy is more, than, more important than being happy. Now, most of us don't really want to hear that. I, I got to tell you, the first time he said that, I wasn't excited about it. I wanted to argue with it. By God's grace, can we admit this and give him praise for it too, that often holy and happy go together? So like choosing holy isn't choosing misery? Often they go together, but not always. And if I give God glory on earth by completing the work he gave me to do on a consistent daily basis, I can live in the experience of being holy, of giving him glory and trusting him for the joy in the journey. So, what's our assignment, our task? Give God glory. When I was in kindergarten, my mom who was an educator, sent her firstborn son, me, down the street to elementary school for my first day of kindergarten. She had such high hopes for her firstborn child. At the end of the day, Mom's looking for me as I'm walking home, making sure everything's okay, and she notices there's a big note pinned to my shirt. These were the days before teachers cared about kids' self-esteem. <laughs> and so this teacher, Mrs. Kellogg, her name's imprinted to my mind these days, wrote four words on that piece of paper that was pinned to my shirt. The reason I know this is because my mother has oft repeated them over the years. And those four words were, did not follow directions. <laughs> you know, someday... I'm going to stand before my father. You know what I don't want to hear on that day? 
<laughs> you know, I don't want pinned on, I don't know what we're going to be wearing when that happens, but uh, I don't want it pinned on there, did not follow directions. If you're a follower of Jesus, I, I bet I know what you want to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. You gave me glory. You finished. You did what I asked you to do. Yay. Well done. Would you pray with me? Father, we recognize these words of Jesus call us to something. We'll never, we'll never do it perfectly as he did. He provided the ultimate sacrifice. The finished work of Jesus is the, is the thing that makes it all possible. But there's a hunger in those of us who follow Jesus, seek to live that Jesus way of life. There's a hunger to give you glory. Thank you that you don't play hide and seek with your will for those that walk in relationship with you. And so I pray that in each of us, that same desire ultimately fulfilled in Jesus will be at least partially fulfilled in us as we seek to give you glory on earth. And thank you, Lord, thank you that it's not about whether you'll love us or not. It's not about whether we'll earn something or not. It's simply about the fact this Father, dear Father we have loves to work through us, loves to work in us. May it be so every day, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.